will never take me alive I'm getting high with my profile Cocked on these suckers, time to die Even as a youngster Causing ruckus on the back of the bus I was a fool all through high school Kicking up dust, but now I'm labeled as a troublemaker Who can you blame? Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 27 of Big League Flicks, a sports movie podcast. I'm Jamie McKinnon, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-hosts, Christian Webster and Jordan Reed. How are we doing tonight, boys? What's going on, fellas? Big night tonight. Uh, another big Raps game tonight. Going to take our winning streak to three, and uh, big time movie tonight. We're going to go, uh, we're just going to leave that hat right there and just say we are Georgetown. Suck it, JR. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see everybody, or good to, I guess, be here. Um, yeah, Webb, how about your Georgetown Hoyas who haven't made the NCAA tournament? In We're just going to, oh, don't worry about anyway, that. Anyway, enjoy that. Um, great to be here. Great to do this movie. going to be a good one tonight, boys. What, uh, is Kentucky like, don't they, aren't they like 5 and 12 right now? Or, isn't there something yeah. crazy the whole, about that? The whole NCAA, other than like basically Gonzaga, is a mess this year. Couple really? teams, yeah. couple teams. Everybody's Duke and North Carolina aren't even probably going to make their own tournament. Like it's just, wow. it's all over the map. It's crazy. That's wild. Syracuse is in the tournament, guys. They're chugging yeah. along. Syracuse is taking a little bit of heat. Jimmy B's taking a little bit of heat from Jay Billis and a couple of the other uh, big anal- uh, analysts for uh, his comments about the kid from Duke uh, opting out for the rest of the year. Yeah, I heard that. That's okay. Yeah. They're in the. Uh, I'm just going to say this for you guys. They're in the tournament. Yeah. Get out of here with that East <laughs> Coast talk. Yeah. Not a tournament. It's a tournament. <laughs> it's not no, a bad guy from away, eh, Jamer? Yeah. <laughs> well, so as we've kind of hinted, we are today we're uh, taking a trip onto the old hard court to toss the old round ball around. So we're taking a trip back to 1994 with the cult classic hit, Above the Rim. I had 22 points in that rebound. And we lost. Then maybe the entire team should be here instead of just me. I mean, it's not like anybody else had a good game. Like you didn't give him a chance to. Uh, this my man, Kylie Watson. Kylie Watson, my man, Bird. It was a clear black night, a clear white moon. Warmer G was on the streets trying to console some problems. Yo, I'm telling you, I don't want you seeing my moms again. Teach him. Help him to handle the pressure. What do I know about handling pressure? You can't turn your back on this kid, Shep. You owe it to him. I owe nobody nothing. Pure talent, fatal flaw. That's what the paper said, right? You in handcuffs, Nutso dead on the ground. You don't owe anybody. You forget about Nutso? You ever plan on giving anything back? You better start right now. It's time you and me play. You want you play yourself. I lost out. You hear that nuts on school? He owes me! Marlon Wayne and Bernie Mac. Well, before we dive into this movie, we're going to crack the top on a couple of nice cold beers. So without further ado, let's get into our brew review. What are you drinking tonight, Webb? Well, boys, in honor of five-star recruits Kyle Lee Watson and Tommy Shep Shepard, we decided to enjoy a pint of our own local 12-star recruit from Stone City Hills. Since 2014, Stone City Hills has been a staple in the Kingston area craft beer scene and has been a champion of bringing back creativity to beer making and doing so in a sustainable and responsible way. These folks pride themselves on making beers to be enjoyed socially and do an excellent job of giving back to our local community here in Kingston. This week, we're enjoying a wonderful pint of their 12-star Session Ale. Inspired by Kingston's brewing past, this beer is named after the 12 metal stars on the outside of the old Bajou's Brewery on Wellington Street. At 4.8%, this pale ale with tropical fruit and citrus notes, hazy appearance, give you all the flavor of an IPA without the bitterness or higher alcohol content. 
This is truly a beer you want to enjoy a few of, so go ahead and order yourself a couple bottles. Or better yet, head on down to the tap room and get yourself a 12-star Session Ale. For more information on this and any of their other fine beers, products, and services, including free local delivering during the pandemic, pandemic, excuse me, be sure to check them out on Stone Cities at Stone Cities dot Stone Cities Ales.com. Oh, marbles in my mouth tonight. Or give them a follow on all major social media platforms. Cheers, boys. Cheers, boys. Cheers, everybody. I got it. Yeah. Two sips, you know the deal. Then you kick you us it. off, Jr. You got it. Well, I'm going into the bottle tonight with this one. I was going to yeah. go out of a glass, but I wanted to try it straight out of the bottle. Um, that's good. I like that. That's very like a lot of flavor, very refreshing for how low it is in alcohol content. I kind of like that. You know, that t- tastes like a bigger beer than it actually is. I got to be honest with that. Um, very good, very nice. I like the Stone City for the fact that. They, in our town in Kingston here, they were one of the first ones, it seemed, to kind of set up shop and kind of get the you know, the craft beer thing going, it seemed like it to me anyway. And they seem like they always have a pretty good location. They have a great location up at the street, that's for sure. And their patio is nice. And this is definitely a kind of beer you could have on a patio on a nice summer day. I mean, any beer is good on a patio on a nice summer day. But this one would be delicious uh, on a on draft. I've had a couple other ones of theirs on draft. Uh, Shea Piggy in Kingston is a restaurant here. I've had some of the other Stone City beers on draft there. So, overall, solid beer. I really like it. This is going to be good to, uh, to drink while we uh, talk about this movie, boys. Yep. I, I like this beer. It's uh, it's It's got some nice uh, citrus hops flavors. We haven't... We, we were on the IP, IPA train for a while earlier when we were, like, doing it out of the Raj in the summer. Or at the end of the summer. So... And we took a little break, got into the fall winter beers, and it's nice to kind of take a trip back because we've had our palate cleansed, so to speak. I really like this one. It's got a, a lot of. The, I've had it before. It is a good beer. I haven't had it in a long time, but it's got some really nice uh, citrus hops flavors. It's very, as you mentioned, Jr. It's it's got a lot of uh, a lot of flavor for a beer that's light. That's uh that's lighter in uh, alcohol content. So they've done a great job there, and shout out to those guys. Uh, well done. Yeah, shout out to Ron, the owner, for uh, getting back to us and, and uh, giving us a little bit of uh, uh, ammunition, so to speak, for my uh, for my ad read there. Uh, great pint. Uh, I really like what they do for our local area, too. You know, we talk a lot about uh, this when we've talked about the, the local guys with our friends at Bose and a couple of other places that, you know, during this pandemic, how these guys are really kind of the ones that are hit the hardest yeah. um, just because they're not getting the foot traffic. So. You know, uh, glad to see things are kind of opening back up for these guys and getting people in there. And uh, glad we could uh, we could stop in there this week and and uh, give them some love because uh, they're doing great things for the city. They're always about you know promoting cultural events and uh, trying to get uh, trying to get the word out on uh, just how great our town is. So uh, shout out to these guys. Shout out to Ron and all the the lovely folks down there. Every time I go down there, it's a great time. Um, and they're always very knowledgeable about their beers and will usually pair you up with something that uh, that sits just right on your palate. So cheers. I'm loving this beer as well. I think this uh, I've had this one before uh, and I've enjoyed it quite a bit. I'm pretty sure Mrs. Webster and I maybe went down there once on a little bit of a date night and had a charcuterie board and uh, hammered back <laughs> a few of these. So, you know, we've had a good time once or twice down there. So uh, yeah. cheers, fellas. Cheers. Great. Cheers. So uh, as we mentioned earlier, we're doing Above the Rim tonight. It was written and directed by Barry Michael Cooper, or sorry, written by Barry Michael Cooper and directed by Jeff Pollack. Uh, distributed in 1994 by New Line Cinema. It got a 6.7 rating on Internet Movie Database with a 53% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, budget of, get get your stuff together, Rotten Tomatoes, but uh, budget of $6.5 million and grossed uh, $16.2 million at the box office. Music by Marcus Miller, starring Dwayne Martin, Leon, Tupac Shakur, Marlon Wayans, Wood Harris, and Bernie Mac. Quick movie synopsis. Above the Rim chronicles the story of Kyle Lee Watson, a promising high school basketball star, and his journey during his senior year of high school. Watson is under tremendous pressure as he looks to punch his ticket out of, out of uh, Brooklyn. The story focuses on his relationships with Bertie, a powerful drug dealer, and Bertie's older brother, Thomas Shep Shepard himself once a promising high school star at Kyle's school, now employed as a security guard. Uh, let's jump into our character review, and let's start out with uh, Kyle Lee Watson, played by Dwayne Martin. Well, 
<clears throat> Kelly Watson. Um, I hadn't seen this movie in a long time. So when I rewatched it, there was a lot of things that I kind of had to remember or take back in. It had probably been almost 20 years, let's be honest. Uh, Kylie Watson's one of those guys who was desperate and was going to have to do what he had to do. Um, his overconfidence sometimes was helped him, but it was also detrimental to him, I found. Um, I found I liked his character, but sometimes I didn't like him at the same time. I really oh, yeah. kind of flip-flopped on the guy. I... L- I, I thought a little more humility might have helped him sometimes, but it's also that same competitive drive that makes him successful. And I think deep down, he's just a scared little kid. Um, he's His life is brutal. <laughs> and he knows it is. And he's desperate, and he's doing what he has to do to get his way out. And then the same, I mean, Webb has the biggie quote he may say later, but basketball <laughs> is his way out of getting out of his circumstances. I put a couple things out, and a couple things I need to see. I said, you know, the montage uh, where he's working out with the with the with the push up bars, unreal. All that kind of stuff is amazing, and you see some of the drive in him, and you see the skill. Um, one thing, boys, he has to work on are his basketball numbers: double zero and fifty four. Those are atrocious basketball numbers for the position <laughs> he's playing. I'm sorry, I have to say that. Good catch. Right? Good catch. Yeah. Um, he also it was kind of interesting to see. Um, it's kind of like to me. You know, the early 90s, mid 90s and web. I'm sorry to say this, but like when Georgetown was like the place to go and it was, you know, it was it. And in the time of this movie, Georgetown was dominant and it was the place to go. They had just run their their morning years, their Ewing time, their Macombo time. I think AI wasn't yet, but was AI already? I can't. I, I get my years. Not quite. Not yet. He's, he was he's, actually in his trial was going on when they. Was yeah, right. okay. I knew it was right around that time. But anyway. I think he was an awesome character, but at the same time, I flip-flopped on him between liking him, connecting with him, not connecting with him. Um, overall, really important. Did a great job. Um, well, I think he was just, I liked him, but I didn't love him. He needed he, as, uh, he needed a little comeuppance. He did. Right? He, he, he needed a little, I, I, I hear you, and I mean, I think, to all, to a certain extent, um, what makes his character great is the fact that you see that right that transition happen where he yeah. starts to realize that there are a bunch of people in the cor- in his corner for him uh, who are out looking who are genuinely looking out for his best interests. Um, unlike you know Birdie, who's <laughs> got his own selfish motivations for wanting to help him, um, and so you you know you. You have a hard time rooting for him because he seems to be making stupid decisions and he's easily influenced. Um, but yeah, he's a he's a he's a good talent. Uh, he's a good talent. He's not a great talent. Uh, I actually think it's kind of funny, you know, all this stuff. He's a terrible shooter, uh, yeah. and he's got no real range as a shooter either, right? Even the three pointer that he hits in that game winning shot mm-hmm. for Georgetown, that's a college three and just barely a college three um and he only gets that off because he gets a sweet screen made for him so i mean we laugh i I was laughing as i was watching that and i've seen this movie i don't know how many countless times it's a it's a go-to for me um but yeah i was laughing out loud uh my my wife was catching it with me last night and i just said like that screen, that down screen play, I think I've run I don't know how many times in a tournament when I need kids just to get an open shot and a ba- and, a, and a, uh, a bucket, or at least a good look at a bucket. And I think a lot of teams probably run that same inbound play, right? Yeah. The line play, and then you kind of run a down screen and, and you have the guy fade into the corner or, or uh, mid-range three, if you want to call it. But yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty funny. Kyle, Kyle Lee Watson, very braggadocious. Um, but rightfully so. I mean, he's he's playing uh, he's playing at a high level, uh, and he does pretty well, except you know against Montrose. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't have much to add. You guys nailed it all. Uh, I thought um, Dwayne Martin did a really good job in the role. Yeah. Uh, did absolutely. you know that Dwayne Martin was 28 when he shot when he shot this? He was 28 I, years old. I could see that. And it was funny though, like because like. He didn't seem like a an old guy playing a young role to me. He played it really well. He, you know, he kind of he pulled yeah. it off. I thought. I he feel like that job. was pretty. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like uh, consistent, maybe with the times, right? Like I remember yeah. when we were kids. Like you had what was it nine oh two one oh? They were all like thirty playing <laughs> yeah. like sixteen year olds, right? Like yeah. I feel like that's just a Hollywood thing where you want guy, yeah. you want actors and actresses who are you know 
real human beings and have done a little bit of living so they can sure. embody these characters a bit. So yeah, no, I, I think he did a great them. job. You also want those actors to have like a body and not just like little tube <laughs> arms and you know, like let's be recall like it is like, like buggy whip arms, like JR. yeah, little, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. you want them to look a certain way let's jump forward to uh tommy uh tommy shep shepherd played by leon oh this is a cool character this is probably my favorite character in the movie um he i liked a lot of things about him i thought i liked how how calm he was he was very peaceful at certain points he was a kind of like a mentor a leader but at the same time, in the modern day terms, that guy has a lot of unpacking to do. <laughs> There's a lot of unpacking that this gentleman needs. I thought he was super cool. Handsome as all you get out to. Um, Sick but just jacket like, game. He had oh, unreal oh, yeah. game was oh, yeah. He was playing one-on-one against Kyle Lee with a jacket on. I made a note of that. I'm like, this guy's unbelievable. He's keeping his pea coat on. His, his, pea his pea coat looked- game is strong. He yeah. looked like he got that jacket out of the Jay Peterman catalog or whatever. Hundred percent with an oh, urban man. Hey, when top. you sing when you sing the Shaft's th- theme song, you better look the part too. He, yeah. he was looking pretty good. Looking sharp. So I had some of those things. I also had you know how cool he was, how suave he was, how neat he was. He was also such a tragic character at the same time. Um, yeah. One of those what ifs. And I kind of feel like we've said this before in this podcast, but like he's one of those what ifs what could have been that we've all grown up with and heard of in different sports right we see it in canada we probably see a little bit more with hockey but like in you know in brooklyn it's probably basketball football whatever wherever you are in whatever town you're in there's always the could have been person and he falls into that category you know 100 percent. you get the lot the freak accident all that kind of stuff that occurred to him uh really cool guy really cool character leon uh i really enjoyed him and i remember again taking that 20 some odd years off between the watching it i remember how cool he was even back then that character to me holds and just the whole persona of him holds to today well yeah he's definitely a damaged individual for sure right he's living with the the demons of uh nuts old past i guess mm-hmm. um i think the thing that i always find interesting about his character is just they never really i i've never made sense of this and i've watched this movie i don't know how many countless times I never understand the utter just like hatred and dist and and dislike for for Birdie, right? Like yeah. if it, like the guy has clearly has some kind of like mental breakdown after his best friend dies and he and he leaves and his younger brother steps up, albeit you know in a rather dishonest and and ill reproof fashion, but he takes care of the family and the mom and everything else. He did the best and, he could. He did the best he could, and with he, he he was resourceful and did what he what he had to do. And yet, you know, Shep kind of big times him the first interaction between the two of them in the movie, and he's he's really a prick to him the entire movie. Um, yeah. And it's never it's never really kind of explained. Um, and you, I mean, from from Birdie's standpoint, you kind of understand why he's pissed off because he's like, "What the hell? Like uh, this guy's totally just throwing me away here and and not." not giving me any kind of love or respect but the other other end of it you never really understand why shep is is so against him i guess maybe it's just his moral compass and his code i guess but we never yeah. really actually ever get to the bottom of that that rubbed me the wrong way too when i watched it i'm like hey man like you booked it on your family left yeah. your mom in a tough spot and this guy did the best he could with what he could i mean he was he was younger than you he probably was in his teens you know obviously and he did the best that he could like you should yeah, you should at least kind of give him a little bit of credit there, or at least try to extend an arm or something. Like, yeah, I, that rubbed me the wrong way with Shep. That was one thing I had him as a character. I'm like, yeah, I get it. Like, you have this moral compass or whatever, but where's your where's your decency to to look at that situation and say, you know, there's stuff I could have done better. And and not only that, and I mean, if you don't agree with what he's doing, aside. He's offering to do it with you and like basically yeah. like I'm going to help you so you don't have to be a shitty security guard job and I'm going right. to kind of take you out. I mean, whatever. Maybe it's, your moral compass can rub off on him in the same time. That's, yeah. yeah. But if you're, if you're a chef. And I mean, that's a boring movie, movie though, but. <laughs> it's a super <laughs> <Yeah>. boring movie. <laughs> if you see chef and you see what your brother, yeah, he does what he has to do, but your brother becomes essentially kind of a scumbag or a hood, yeah. uh, whatever you want to call it. I think they should have written that seem character. Never, sorry? 
No, sorry to interrupt. I, I was no. saying I think they should uh, they should have written that character arc a little differently. I agree with you on that, and that's what's the point I was going to say too. Oh. There's a little bit more work. You only put an hour thirty seven into that movie, <laughs> so maybe an extra ten minutes, kind of building in that arc yes. a little bit more and seeing yep. a little bit more backstory to make yep. it an hour forty seven. You're still well under two hours. Yep. I agree with that, but I I think they're trying to make us infer why we. Shep doesn't like Birdie. I think they're right. kind of making the viewers say, like, hey, you, you know why he doesn't like this guy. He's doing this, that, and the other thing. And we'll talk about Birdie in a few minutes. But I think an extra maybe 10 minutes on that arc because, I mean, it's a cliche arc. I'm sorry it is. Yeah, it's yeah. very cliche. We're yeah. like, okay, yeah, shocker. Something happens. But anyway, I think that's what I was going to say. A couple more minutes on that arc wouldn't hurt. That's good. Let's uh, transition into Birdie, played by Tupac Shakur. R.I.P. Okay. Yeah, per- yeah, of course. R.I.P. Well, uh, he might be. There he might be. There's rumors. <laughs> Jesus. According to our friend Jinerak, he's in Chile. He's, been, he's in Chile. Okay. He's in Santiago, Chile. Okay? He's coming back. Just like Elvis is time. in. Hey, just like Elvis is in Tweed. Yeah, Elvis is in Tweed, Ontario. He lives, baby, every August. <laughs> uh, Birdie. I mean, if you're gonna get Tupac Shakur to play a perfect gangster, like this guy can play it because he was it. Um, so. Rushed. Yeah, he did. Um, he's the master manipulator. He's using his money, his power, his influence. He manipulates everybody to get his way. And he, you know, intimidation. He's he's scary. Like, yeah. man, I, he's acting <laughs> at the time. I mean, I mean, he's a very talented individual too. I think everyone. I think I think most people know that about Tupac, but his talent was unbelievable. His yeah. writing, his, his ability, and like just his pure language skills alone are amazing um angry i we talked about that you guys talked about it already about how he had to take care of business and i agree with you guys on that he did what he had to do was it the right way to do it no it was not yeah uh, the life expectancy of that you know it's going to be short um but uh he kind of needs to get a new cell phone at this point that cell phone's awful but his talking- cell phone was amazing what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> that thing's atrocious. He had some cool moves. I mean, you could see Tupac, and this is to me, in my own opinion, adding certain things in that Tupac probably knew how to do, like the razor blade hitting up in the gums. I'm going to go on a limb and say Tupac already knew how to do all that kind of like. Do you know little things you can see him adding into his character? Yeah. And that's he put some time and effort into that character to say, like, okay, how can I do this and do it well? He brought some legitimacy to the character, big time. He really did. And this is whole his body language, his demeanor, his dress, his everything, that, to me, like, it was Tupac. And he makes you I, nervous when he's on screen. Like, I, you I, know, you're putting yourself in, like, the characters. Mm-hmm. You're like, this guy, there's, he's, there's, he makes me nervous. There's a, he's edgy, you know, he is unpredictable. Yeah, and I mean, the way he's interacting with Kylie, like, in the club. Where he's like, okay, you know, the way he's moving around in the club, yeah. the way he's talking in the club, he's done all this before. And I don't even know how much he's acting. I really don't. I think he's just being himself, adding his own like amazing ability into it. And like I said, with the little touch with the razor blade, the touch with the get ups, all that kind of stuff, the lingo, I wonder how much of this was scripted. And I wonder how much of this they said, Tubak, go on and you do your thing. Let and, it rip. You know, yeah. yeah, I really do. Um, I was obviously a big Tubak fan too. So, yeah. and yeah. still am. So uh, that's kind of my just on Tubak playing this yeah. role. He he definitely epitomizes the the old adage of uh, you got to watch out for the quiet ones, right? Because he 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 can snap at any moment and, and kind of go off, right? Like and over like the craziest littlest things, right? Like yeah. the whole thing with Flip is the perfect example of that, right? Like this guy's like down on his luck, like, homeless guy, and he kills him for basically saying what like that guy was your brother, and, yeah. and yeah. tells him to you know go fuck himself. But like that's neither here nor there, like. Seriously, like, what's to be gained in that move? But other than, like, I have to keep my intimidation factor the way it is, right? So, yep, I mean, 100%. it is what it is. I think, JR, you hit on everything. I'm not really going to dwell on it a bit. A fantastic uh, performance by Tupac. It's just, again, it goes to show you just how talented this guy was and, you know, what he might have been capable of from an acting standpoint. I mean, we all know the music standpoint was unreal. But, I mean, between this and Poetic Justice and Juice and just a couple of other films he did, like, the guy was so talented, and it's just Killed sad him. to think that, like, you know, he, he could have been doing all kinds of crazier, different roles. Like, imagine Tupac in, like, a Disney-type movie. Like, how hilarious would that have been? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. The part, guys, I was wondering, like, that part was Flip and Tupac. That was just, a, I found that kind of weird a little bit, too. Like, I didn't think there was much put into that either. 
Yeah. I think it's I shows think, his ruthlessness. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think it's part of his character arc, and I also think it's part of um Kyle's story, right? Just so that yeah. he kind of sees what kind of person Birdie is. Like, I think it's yeah. it's needed, it needed maybe for that. But yeah, okay. there's definitely some, uh, like you said, a, a few holes in the character development that could have sure. definitely got improved upon. The only thing I'll add really quickly was uh, Tupac was actually six years younger than Dwayne Martin. And clearly yeah, he's playing yeah. somebody that's older, right? So mm -hmm. that was pretty cool. Uh, let's move on to Coach Rollins, played by David Bailey. I thought he was great. I thought he was pretty cool. Just one of those coaches looking out for his guys he knew where he's from. He's trying to help Shep out, get him a job. He's grooming him essentially to take over. And he's trying to set him up. Um, overall, I thought he was fine. I, I don't have anything too crazy to say about him. He's, yep. to me, just about a classic coach in an inner city area trying to help keep kids off the streets and safe. That was kind of the gist I got from him. Maybe it's different. I don't know, but... Yeah. That was, that's basically, I don't have much more to say about him. I thought he was great, and I thought he was just like a classic coach role, and he did kind of what he needed to do. But. He's great in that respect. He definitely needs to work on his practices because they seem to do yeah. the same three-man <laughs> weave drill and rebounding drill all the time. No wonder they're losing every game. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, run some, maybe run some offensive sets every once in a while. Uh, but, yeah, no, he, he, uh, he does a great job. And, he, he, you know, he's, he's believable. Uh, the actor playing him was believable in that kind of like, you know, nurturing uh, father figure type um, who wasn't actually a father figure. But yeah, everything you, everything you said, JR, just trying to look out for everybody uh, and take care of his guys. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to, um, I'm going to butcher this name, uh, Malike, Ma Malike, Malike, Malika, Malika, Mom, uh, the moms. Malika. Which is, yeah, which is Kyle. So Malika Watson, I guess. Yeah. Uh, played by Tanya P Pinkins. She was great. She was one of those classic things of trying to do better by her son. Um, she knew the vehicle was education. That's the gist I got from her. Um, she wasn't his friend. She didn't actually care how good he was at basketball. She did, but it was one of those things I don't care right now. I'm not your friend. I'll be your friend later. And it's one of those kind of classic stories of trying to do better by your kids and to ensure your education, um, safety, things like that. The scene where he's getting mad at his mom, and um, I like the scene when um, we're talking about curfew, and it's in my quotes, you know, if I, I carried you and birthed you, I, yeah, you don't give yeah. me a curfew. I thought that was a pretty funny. It's very true, too. I like when she slaps him. I think it's like, great. Like, he's losing his marbles, and she, she's she's a great mom. Like I, I've got a lot of notes Drawing on Drawing single mom. Like, yeah, all, she, all the time, all the time in the world for a mom like her. She has a, she has like a code. She has rules, and she sticks to them. And she's tough. And you know, a lot of the guys, uh, you know, we talk about cliches, but it's it's not necessarily cliche. This is the life for inner city um, individuals. You know, inner city African American individuals coming up. This is what it's like, and you hear it. And whenever we watch like Thirty for Thirties or a football life or any of those documentaries where they do an hour on somebody's career, uh, guys coming up like, you know, the, um, I think I just watched one recently with, uh, Jerome Bettis and, uh, who else was there? There was, I can't remember, but a lot of those guys had the same thing. They had this tough mom who had a, you know, strict code and rules and really held them in line and had always brought them back when they would stray. Cause that was inevitable to happen. Right. And she, she just embodies this entire, um, character in, in, in how she plays in how she plays this role and how it's written. It's really well done. And, uh, she, she killed it. This, um, sorry, uh, Tanya, Tanya Pink, and she does an awesome job. One thing I wanted to note about her mm -hmm. and, oh, here's, here's another thing I really liked. I liked when Shep was kind of, you know, their, their dates are going well, but then when yeah. he ran out on that situation and she just said, no, when he showed up at the door and she's like, I can't take a runner. That, that's her code, right? She's just like, sorry. Yeah. She's, she's polite about it, and she just closes the door on him. She's like, I, I'm not going to have that in my life. I just can't even, I can't go down that road. She's really strict about that. That was great. Well, it's prioritizing her kid first, right? Yes. Which we would think any parent, we would want to do that. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is, she clearly she's super influential on Kyle, just in the work ethic alone, right? Like, okay, I got to get back to my shift. I got to go here. Like, I'll meet you for dinner, but then we're going to do this. And then you're going to, like, 
even though she's working crazy hours and she's probably dog tired, she's still on his ass, making sure he's going to school, making sure he's, you know, getting to practice, making sure he's showing up for things on time, making sure he's trying to get home for curfew. Like, you know, she's working to the bone and she's still just doing it. She's a rock star. I love, I love yeah, this she, mom character. She might, I think she's my favorite character maybe in the movie. And the one thing I wanted to mention about her, she's only three years older than Dwayne Martin. That's yeah. funny. <laughs> Playing his mom. That's <laughs> funny. But she pulls it off. Like when I'm watching it, if I hadn't read that, I'm like, yeah, that's her. That, she could be his mom, I guess. You know? Yeah, totally. They both look, they both look stupid young. So I mean, yeah. it worked. Yeah, it worked out pretty well. Um, let's move on to one of my favorite characters in the movie, Flip, played by the late, great Bernie Mac. <laughs> R.I.P. Bernie Mac. Mr. 3000, baby. Um, I don't have much to say. I mean, I think he helped... I actually think he helped to carry Kyle Lee's character a little bit. I think he probably had kind of a foundation to it. and like, You could tell he had some experience. Dude, Flip was a like glue it. guy. He was movie. a glue guy. There was something he, about him in the neighborhood where he I, can't run him for him. I'm not coming to get you. I'm not doing whatever. Like, Flip. He, like he tied a lot of storylines together. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's... There, there's one main storyline, but I mean, he, he pulled a lot of them in and made, and like you touched on it, Webb, we had to see Birdie cross the line for Kyle to come back over the line. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, mm -hmm. in the, and then, and in that sense, Flip was a glue guy and he was tied to Shep, you know, obviously, cause they had a past. So that yeah, was, that's a good point. And I think you mean that in the neighborhood though, he also seemed like a constant where it's like okay you need to see flip the old rummy at the wawa or wherever he was you know wherever they're hanging out i think they needed that and that was one of those things too jamer made a good point about that where to me as a glue guy he needs to be part of this neighborhood and when he was missing and gone and well he's dead it just threw off everything too and kind of was yeah. one of those things for kyle and he's like where's flip this wasn't right yeah and, and his yellow like, eyes and his yellow eyes could go stop traffic yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's some hilarious but, um the thing, the other thing I loved about Flip too is he didn't take any shit, no. especially from the young bucks. No, ho, 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 ho. like if no, I no. if I ever if I ever God forbid I come on really hard times and I end up like that guy, and you find me out in like City Park or whatever hustling kids, <laughs> um, like I, that's how I'd be. I'd be like, shut up, we're gonna play boots, <laughs> crazy hard, scar your ass, Baldine motherfucking bones. Is it a bet? <laughs> yeah, I love Flip. I just love Bernie Mac. And <laughs> you put Bernie Mac in anything, I'm watching it because it's entertaining. I love, I love Bernie Mac. Um, totally underrated for uh, for a lot of his stuff. Totally he underrated. Great. He was great. He's got some great cameos in the uh, in the House Party two or three, whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so good. Uh, let's move on to Boogaloo, played by Marlon Way Wayans. <sighs> Can't stand this guy. <laughs> I was waiting. Uh, JR was going to say that. I, I can't it. stand this guy. He's the ultimate jail cover. If you've ever seen jail cover, he's Corey Trevor from Trailer Park Boys. <laughs> okay? He's brutal. I'm sorry. I have no time for him. I'm like, here, Corey Trevor, Corey Trevor. He's the same thing. He's pathetic. I love it. Somebody needs to show this guy what to do. I literally wrote in my notes, jail cover, a pawn, and talks too much. There's a point when someone talks too much. This guy talks too much. So were you were you mad when Bernie offed him in the end? Did you want Bernie Bernie to be the one that offed him? Oh well, yeah, they had no he, kidding. He offed Bernie. He offed Bernie in the end. I thought it was very cliche when he yeah. offed Bernie in the end. I'm like, here it comes in the club. You knew it was gonna happen. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, He's a 14 good year gold Urkel. He, that's one of my twelve <laughs> that's my favorite lines. He's such a tool. Well, that's all I can say. That guy. That guy. I remember 20 years ago, I didn't like him. Didn't like him again two days ago either. Go ahead. This has got to be one of his first uh, major movie roles, I would think, Marlon Wayans. Right? Yeah. He would have been he would have been really young when this came out. I don't know the exact age yeah. he would have been, but um, I have to double check and I'm gonna rewatch it. But I had down in my notes the first scene we we get see we introduced to him where he walks into the gym in that first game with Birdie and everybody else. I'm pretty sure he had the Kramer basketball shoes on. Oh yeah? Oh, like the Jimmy ones with the Jimmys. Yeah, I'm Jimmy's pretty like sure. I I did. I was. I did a the, deep the dive George on the Stanza shoes. ones. Yeah. yeah, I did a deep dive on the shoes as usual because it's a basketball movie, and uh, you know he he. I'm pretty sure he's rocking those. I only kind of caught it quickly, and then 
you know, something happened and I lost my attention for a minute. But um, I have to go back and rewatch it to see because I think he walks in with those on. And I just, I remember thinking briefly, Jimmy! Uh, and I had a good chuckle. <laughs> but he, yeah, he, he's great. You need him in this movie because you need a little bit of comic relief because the rest Maybe of the not. movie is so dark and grimy. You need no. him. Um, he has probably some of the best lines in the movie. Drops the end bomb quite a few times. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't know if I can quote all the ones I'd like no. to quote from him because I'm just not going there. But no. he he has some great lines in this movie, and uh, you need him, and you need him again for Kyle's character arc um, to kind of see. I like the way you put it, Jamer. Kind of to get close to that line, walk and kind of flirt with the line, and maybe I'm going to cross it. And if I cross it, I'm going to go down this route. If I don't cross it, I'm going to go you know the straight and narrow path. You need him to kind of bring him, to Kyle, towards that line. Yeah, but right? Webb, does he have to be that pathetic? Yes. No, I liked it. Look I, at the guy. He's yes. So pathetic. No, he's still pathetic. You can do this in a better way and not be that pathetic of a character. So I like, you can still be like, some, uh, just the way he carries himself, his lines, his actions, the way his body language, everything about him. You don't have to be that pathetic to get that sympathetic role. To but it's like you said, he's a, that he's line, a, whatever you want to call it. No, he's so pathetic in this movie. I he's a perfect, know. he's a perfect jail cover when he's looking at Kyle's wang and calling it the big anteater <laughs> and everything else. He's yeah. a, like, you, you nailed it. Like, I, I was dying <laughs> laughing because as soon as you said that, all I was thinking was like, boogaloo smokes, boogaloo smokes. Yeah. yeah. Corey Trevor smokes. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> go down and get me chicken chips. But that's not here or there. I couldn't stand them. Sorry, boys. Um, and I also, okay, so let's jump into. Mota, played by our boy Wood Harris. Uh, I love Wood Harris. In, uh... <laughs> I love Wood Harris. Um, first I feel major like movie role. This is the birth of Avon Barksdale from The Wire, guys. Yeah. I think he drawed on this one for Avon Barksdale, and I bet you he drawed on some of the way Tupac carried himself and carried it in The Wire a few years later. He was great in this movie. Yeah, he's, he's a motherfucking great. soldier. He's a he soldier, is, and he's great in every movie. Uh, nothing but love for Wood Harris. Um, Seems like a good human being, too. It's, I, think, I think he's just an awesome guy. Uh, great job. He has a character. This guy's stone-cold psychopath. Um, I think some of the way he played basketball, I don't know if that would fly. <laughs> a little um, outside of the rules. <laughs> yeah, a little outside of the rules. And then when he got hit in the nuts, when uh, Chef hit him in the nuts, that was amazing. I was like, that's old school. You, got, uh, you just got played by like one of the old boys. I think this that here is a man's game. Yeah. yeah, I think that was pretty funny. I liked that. Uh, great job. He played that like lieutenant, so to speak, to the main guy really well. Um, and he played the muscle, and he took it serious. And the intensity Wood Harris has in roles sometimes is scary. Yeah, and Wood yeah. Harris is one hell of an athlete. He's, he oh, is yeah. right, he's like good, he is one baller. hell of an athlete. Uh, so this, go I was gonna say, for this particular character. Totally scary. Totally, totally nailed it. Uh, I thought he did a hell of a job. I imagine he probably, he probably. I, I imagine all the guys on set probably had a cool time hanging out with Pac at this time. Like, he, yeah. it, this is Pac's heyday at this point, right? Yeah. So, yeah. he's big time. Um, and so, like, they they probably had a great time. And he probably uh, some of that character probably was inspired by what was he was seeing and hearing. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, the other thing I will say about him is. Uh, he went to the Bill Lambeer School of Basketball. Uh, <laughs> he's just, just a uh, hell of a pro. Yeah. I also That's thought, true. you know what I thought too of Wood Harris when I was watching this again, and then again, all that big gap in between was, for listeners, like if you've ever watched The Wire, give it a watch. But in season one, when Wood Harris is even on Barksdale, he's coaching a team against Proposition Joe. They have a big basketball game. And I thought, that was like that was the same character he's essentially playing. I wonder if he carried some of that like, street ball idea. Anyway, JR, JR, did you catch the the kicks he was wearing? No, the old BK Dimacells. Oh, British Knights, yes. British oh, Knights. British. No That's way. Great. I saw the sponsorship for British Knights. Yeah. Well played. I used to though. love BK Knights back in the day. Well played. Yeah. Yeah. The Dimacells were sick them. shoes. And the Dimacells were one of the first shoes. I think. I believe. I have to look at the the picture, but I believe they were one of the first shoes to start toying with the idea of putting the extra strap on oh there's sweet. another i can't remember if it does there's a because there's a pair of barclays in this too that have a, a strap on them so i can't remember if i'm thinking those are 
or the diamond cells. I don't think it was the diamond cells. Actually, now that I think about it, my favorite were the my favorite BKs were the like the old school ones, the black and white ones that were like oh yeah oh, yeah yeah. Can you still? I wonder if you could probably still get them. Like you break your oh, back if you, would, if you tried to run in them. Like the Jamers, point. Jamers, Jamers hookup overseas would be able to send them a pair. Yeah, yeah we could get some BKs for the boys. That would be yeah. all right. That'd be all right for sure. British Knights, send us a pair. Send me a yeah. box. Are there any other notable characters you want to mention? I got one. Yeah, Not go ahead. so. Not, Not so. so is hands down Not the so. most important character to this movie. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without Not so, we don't get any pain from Shep. We got oh. Tupac's going to be a, a Boy Scout the rest of his life because Shep's yes. going to have him on Easy Street. Uh, <laughs> Kyle Lee Watson's going to never make it to Georgetown because he's going to be getting locked up by Montross every five seconds. So I'm going to go with Nutso as the most important character in this movie. That's um, awesome. I just wanted to mention, and you mentioned him right there, Webb, was uh, Montross. So the character Montross, this is 1994. So the character Montross, I think, has to be an ode to Eric Montross. Because he's playing against him. He calls him Mr. Uh, Mr. Car uh, North Carolina. And the guy's a white guy with a flat top haircut. Yeah. yeah. That's got to be and an only, ode. I mean, the only difference, obviously, is the position, not, right? Yeah, he's not six foot or seven foot two or whatever he was, right? Yeah, I think my... Uh, my and when I think back on this, my immediate thought about him is Bobby Hurley. Yeah, uh, that's who I who I go to when I think of of Montrose. That's who he embodies to me, right? Like he was that guy. Yeah, uh, and right. and and like Bobby, like I'm pretty sure they play. What is it? Holy, uh, Holy Cross or St. Mary's or whatever the school that he's his dad coached at forever. I can't remember now. This is yeah. that's making me sound terrible, but you know, like they're an inner city New York school, and that was the big thing, or yeah. Jersey or wherever the hell he's from, somewhere on the East Coast. Yeah, for sure. When he Can when I he said that. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jamer. No, no go sorry. Ahead. When he said when he calls him Mister North Carolina, though, I was like, yeah. Okay, yeah. Up. Uh, one thing I want to say that I picked out before we move on is this isn't characters or anything, but we were talking about British knights and we were talking about like all the sponsors on the um, cage around. I loved how it was like this hard, like inner city, what you know, Rocker Park, wherever they're playing, Gatorade, and all that. Did you catch the IKEA sponsor on the wall? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> oh yeah. I didn't even IKEA know they were around. Sponsor. I was like, oh, we're gonna Allen run some nice uh, little uh, bookshelves <laughs> here. Like we're all hardcore in our city, and then there's quick IKEA sponsor on the wall. <laughs> how about how about the uh, the shameless uh, the beer signs that were turned off outside the pub there when when Shep gets cornered by Tupac in the beginning. And then outside uh, when they're having the conversation and they, they're standing outside the Reebok setup. If you look yeah. closely at the Reebok set, set up, and I didn't notice this until I was reading an article on Complex, there's actually a pair of Nike shoes on that in that display where it's like all the Reebok stuff, which really? I'm like, that's probably a mishap on somebody's part. That's pretty funny. You know what was awesome with the Reebok stuff? And Jay Marie, you'll remember this. They had an ad for the Reeboks, and right beside a Reeboks was the Reebok Insta Pump. Remember the yeah. pump? Nice. Pump up? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hell pump yeah. Up. Boogaloo, rocks, Boogaloo rocks a pair of them when he comes out as Urkel. Yeah, yeah. the instant pumps. Oh, unreal. Anyway, sorry. Well, so let's jump into uh, to our favorite quotes. What do you guys have for quotes? Um, I had, the, well, the 14 karat Urkel. Um, the, yeah. When mom was letting uh, Kyle Lee have it, no rent, no bills, and didn't bring me into this world. I love the no rent, no bills, that whole part. Um, we talked about, sorry, future doesn't depend on basketball. I thought that was a really important quote to kind of keep in mind the whole time in this movie, like, and to carry with you as you grow up. And one from Tupac that I thought, uh, when he said it to him, like, being alone makes you strong. I thought that was a good Tupac quote. It was very, like, seemed like a Tupac lyric, too. Really. Yeah. That whole being alone makes you strong, that seems to me, that's very Tupac Shakur, like, at least in my experience, anyway, like, uh, yeah, mine, I, we talked to a couple about those, uh, the 14 karat gold Urkel, uh, mine, a couple of mine were for Boogaloo's, uh, what you've been lifting weights with that thing, uh, yeah. when he's talking about his, his Johnson, uh, looks like Daffy Duck with his beak shot off. Yes. Uh, that's a pretty good one. Uh, and then, uh, one of the other ones, one of my favorites is, uh, right before the shootout when, uh, Tyrone is talking about how. The Bombers can win it all, and Bombers, Bombers, Bombers championship. And Tyrone, give me the rock. Just give me the rock. Tyrone about to get his swerve on. Give me the rock. 
That guy was hilarious. Just yeah. a just a quick character, Tyrone. He, he was priceless. What's it like sucking on Bertie's dick? <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple of I, I went a little deeper in my, a couple of quotes I wanted to mention. So, uh, um, Kyle's mom says uh, when she's talking to Shep, she says, uh, "What about you? Where does your mind run to?" And he says, "Nowhere. It's just stuck. It's the rest of me that keeps running." I thought that was a pretty good quote because that's you know his his mind is stuck with that not so game and mm-hmm. he's constantly reliving that in almost every moment. It seems like. And the rest of him is running away from his life, basically. So I thought it was a pretty good quote. And also the yeah. other one I liked, and it goes back to Coach Rollins. I really like Coach Rollins in this one. He says, Kyle, you forgot your about your team. And Kyle Lee's like, I had 22 points and 8 rebounds. And Rollins is like, and we lost. Yeah. And then Kyle Lee's like, then maybe the entire team should be in here instead of me. It's not like anybody else had a good game. And then Rollins says, you didn't give them a chance to. And that's just the sort of things that the recruiters are looking for. And that's totally true. Like, and I'll get into it later, but like a hundred percent, like you, there's so many kids out there with talent. Recruiters are looking for character, leadership, things like that. And he's failing that test for sure. Yeah. Being a good teammate for sure. Yeah. Let's jump into some little known facts. So, um, wait, James, before you do that on oh, that note too, I was yeah. going to say with Kyle and I forgot to mention this in our character review. No way in hell he has a chance against Starnes. Starnes would eat him for breakfast, lunch, oh, and dinner when he's God, yeah. I'm like, or when he throws the chair at at uh, at Shep. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, little guy syndrome. Punching above the belt. Uh, punching above his weight class. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So little known facts. Uh, so director Jeff Pollock, he's actually best known as the co-creator and lead writer for the '90s sitcom uh, The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I thought that was pretty good. So Pollock, sadly, was found dead of a suspected heart attack after jogging on the green belt in Hermosa Beach, California, on December 23rd, 2013. So, yeah, sad to sad to hear about that. Yikes. You're right, Webb. This is uh, Wood Harris's film debut. I think you, did you mention that? Yeah. I think you mentioned that, yeah. So when asked about who he originally wanted to play the role of uh, Kyle Lee Watson, Barry Michael Cooper who, who wrote the film, said, hands down, it was Alan Payne. So Cooper knew Payne from the film New Jack City, which Cooper wrote as well. And Payne uh, was from the Bronx and was a, was a known baller around the neighborhoods. You guys will rem- remember him from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air as Will's rival point guard, Marcus Stokes. Marcus from, Stokes. Uh, from Malibu Prep. Remember That's that episode? Right. Oh, yeah. He, he got the recruiter. He had a kid, I think, too. Yeah, he did. And Will let up on him. Yeah. 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 So Dwayne Martin starred as a guard on the New York and uh, NYU's Division Three squad in the late '80s. He was the first a first team All Association selection in 1988-89, and was the Howard Ken Award uh, recipient that same season as an MVP. He ended up signing with the New York Knicks, but I think he was cut during training camp or played on like one of their developmental teams or something like that. So do he was a legit baller. That guy. Could do you have play. his? Do you have his measurements, Jr. or James? Like, what's he listed at? I'd be curious list, to know. He's small. He's listed at like five eleven, I think. So, which means he's probably like five nine or ten. Yeah. He He'd looks, probably be speedy as all hell, though. Yeah, yeah. Like he he had good handles. Like, he oh had, yeah, like, really good handles. He's probably a good passer. Not his the feet, best. His group. feet looked awful in his jump shot. Yeah, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, I think his shooting left. Like you mentioned, you know more than, about it than I do, but that's one thing that I kind of noticed too a little bit. Like it just didn't look, he didn't look like he had a lot of. Just mechanically risk. speaking, he looked kind of off balance. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you could kind of tell he was forcing those. I mean, the, the shots he's missing, I mean, it's not hard. Like anybody no. can miss shots easy, and but whatever. He, he looked like he'd be forcing a couple every once in a while. I don't know how many takes that would he, he, I mean, he could probably still whoop my ass in a game of one-on-one. That's for sure. But still, I think he looked better to me. He looked better in white men can't jump. Cause he was in that and, uh, in that movie as well. And he would have been closer to his playing days. Yeah. Um, and he's also in, uh, the other one we did there, Ray Allen. Oh, he was got, game? yeah. He got game. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he's in that. Was he? I'm pretty sure. Shoot, I didn't know that. Huh? Yeah, pretty sure. Oh. I'd have to. Oh, maybe I'm thinking of something else. He might yeah, be right I, there. 
I might have been thinking White Man Can Jump. Sorry. I think he was just in White Man Can Jump. So Leon, who who grew up in the Bronx, he actually attended uh, California's Loyola Loyola Marymount University on a basketball scholarship, and and later played professionally overseas. It was while playing in Italy that he was approached about starring in Above the Rim. So that's pretty oh, cool. cool. He was silky. Yeah, he's uh, he, he was he was good too in uh, um, Cool Runnings. Yeah. Oh yeah, he was really great in Cool Runnings. That's another see and. I find with the with his stroke in particular, I don't feel like the camera angles did him justice. His, no, he his, had a pretty d- decent stroke. Yeah, but his strokes look really off balance and off kilter. And when he let his shooting hand go, he was almost always pushing it outward. Yeah. Uh, and it just had a weird release that I'm like, there's no way that should have gone in. Right, right. So anyway, sorry. Yeah, they, you're, you're right. I think, it, yeah, they did a lot of like, Side just camera. weird camera angles for his his shot. Anyway, yeah, sorry. So the role of Shep was actually originally offered to Denzel Washington, who had another project on the go at the time. He would have been wicked in that role too. Mm-hmm. I mean, this would was, if they had him, that would have bumped up the old Rotten Tomato score. Oh, big time, big time. So writer Barry Michael Cooper uh, grew up idolizing the legendary ballers on the New York streetball scenes during the 70s and 80s in Rucker Park. So he used to go down to Rucker Park all the time during that time. So a lot of the vibe and dialogue came from this inspiration in when he was writing the script. It made sense. Like, I, I felt there was a lot of, especially when there was, like, the tournament stuff going on, and there was a lot of good, kind of that vibe going. I thought they did that really well. Mm-hmm. Rucker basketball and New York streetball legend Richard Peewee Kirkland was the technical advisor on the film, and he also played the role of Georgetown scout Phil Red. That guy had a wicked afro too, like oh, yeah. his blowout hair. On oh, yeah. perfect. So Marlon Wayans and Tupac Shakur became good friends while filming 1992's Jews. Oh, I, I didn't realize uh, Marlon Wayans was in Jews actually. So I guess he must have been that. That must have been one of his early films. So the next year, they joined forces again on Above the Rim. They shared a two-bedroom trailer on set in Rucker Park. When asked about what it was like, Wayne says, uh, Pac smoked a lot of weed. <laughs> 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 I can imagine there's maybe a few other things going on at that time. Yeah. So Above the Rim was part of a 1994 Hollywood basketball renaissance. A month before the film hit theaters, Nick Nolte, Shaquille O'Neal, and Penny Hardaway starred in Blue Chips. Later that year came Hoop Dreams, the masterful James, uh, Steve James documentary. Hoop Dreams is a great doc. Mm-hmm. And I love, I love Blue Chips, too, as well. So while Above the Rim has risen to cult status in the quarter century since its release, many at the time blasted the film. The Washington Post dubbed it as a stultifying cliche of a movie that doesn't get anywhere near the rim. Variety said that the movie was composed of enough cliches to fill an NBA stat sheet. I mean, it is. There's a lot of cliches, but they're not wrong, in my opinion. Like, I mean, the cliches aren't wrong. There's, they are what they are. Uh, Tupac was praised for his acting in the film by most critics. However, having Tupac as a main actor in the film came with many challenges. Tupac had already been in a lot of legal problems at the time of filming. In November 1993, he was charged with shooting two off-duty suburban Atlanta policemen. Those charges were eventually dropped. But shortly before Thanksgiving, Shakur, along with two associates, uh, were charged with sexual assault of a woman in a New York City uh, Parker Meridian hotel room. So Shakur's legal proceedings were a constant backdrop during the the filming of Above the Rim, the stress of which took its toll on the cast. Leon had this to say about the situation. Oh, it definitely affected all of us, you know. Uh, We had to change the shooting schedule and delay production. It was definitely a distraction. That would be kind of frustrating, but he was he was kind of a big deal at that time, so he was uh I would say he would have been the headliner oh yeah, absolutely with this film. cast, yeah, well, yeah. like you think about it, and I mean Marlon Wayans has a bit of a name because the Wayans family has a yes. name with things like in living color at this point, but other than that, Leon's pretty much an unknown no. uh Dwayne Martin's more or less an unknown at this point. Yep. And, you know, there's nobody in it that's, you know. I would have liked to have seen 
Denzel Washington playoffs at Tupac and see how. Oh, it would have been unreal. That would have been so good. Because yeah. you have like intimidating Tupac you know, and Denzel right back at you, kind of on screen in the presence. I think that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's jump into our realism review. What did you have as realistic? What was unrealistic about the movie? All right, uh, I'll fire away here. Um, I had that you know the Rucker Park piece was pretty cool. I think that was kind of awesome how like it was proper and that was the place. I thought the high school gym was awesome. They played it with the with the track around the top. It made a really cool atmosphere. And that's I a that legit crazy. gym. That's a that's a legit gym in Brooklyn. It's yeah, the same I one got, from a same one from. A, he got game. It, he got yeah. game. Thank you. I'm drawing and a blank the, on that the, movie. The all night. Really cool. And then uh, I made a note about that. But the he got game, and I was like, that's the same one. But I thought it was just a, such a cool gym. And no joke about Marcus Stokes, but it's not like a Fresh Prince Bel Air sized gym that they played in. Like it's a real proper gym that it's going down, and I really think that helps. I think some of the other real stuff is the politics behind it, the lifestyles behind it, the fear, the intimidation, the using basketball as your vehicle to get out. I like to look at movies like this from that point of view of like where basketball is his vehicle to move. Mom knows it, he knows it. Um, the not diplomacy, but like the workings of working the street gangs, keeping it where you need to be so you're safe and insulated and protected. That stuff to me is very real in that situation. And when you're doing kind of what you have to do to get out. Uh, yeah. the sponsorships and all that kind of stuff. I mean, those are some big names. The Ikea thing was really funny to me, but you know, an Allen key here or there doesn't change that. Um, for under fake, Kyle's numbers were horrible. The uniforms were horrible. Um, the structure to the game, I thought Maybe you might be able to comment a little bit on that. I thought it's like the way they set up their games and the plays, and like these doesn't seem like proper basketball structure to me. It just yeah. seemed like let it fly and let it roll. Um, the one, the one on ones and the peacoats, I thought that was a little much. I, I just <laughs> we're awesome play, but I, I wrote a note on that. Um, again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like for Shep, that was a pretty forgiving rim that he was shooting on sometimes. And like, there were some really good fair bounces in there that I'm like, yeah, I'm like the ball was a, like this. It was a loose rim. Yeah. Style, it like, just, like, well, I mean, it's gotta be loose when every single basket is a dunk. Yeah. True. 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 I think, anyway, I thought of that when I looked at it, that's like, realistic. That's pretty forgiving. Yeah, it could be it very well could be. And I just kind of thought of that as well. Like pretty forgiving on some of those shots. The rim's leaning right in anyway. That as well. Yeah. I'll let you guys fire away. I mean, from the basketball standpoint, it, it, there's not a whole lot to comment on. It's street ball at its best, right? I mean, even the the gym scenes. Neither one of those two teams are playing any real defense. The way they're yeah. set up, that's like, what I had. The point, the point guard not wanting to give the ball to the big man in the post. That's legit. Uh, even though Starnes has total inside position every single time, like get him the ball, um, but he doesn't. Uh, the drills were pretty pretty legit i'll say like you still run the three-man weave just to work on pace and space you're still going to run that rebounding drill i love that rebounding drill as a kid i always enjoyed doing it as even as a small guy it made you feel big because you were getting up and getting it in the air um so i loved i love that rebounding drill but yeah the actual basketball scene it's street ball right like even in that whole tournament uh 41 is i think his name's speedy williams uh, I don't know if you got that one or not, Jamin, in, in your notes, but no. he he was uh, he's like an, a Rucker Park street ball legend. Oh, nice! Uh, and so, like, he throws one of the nastiest passes. I still love talking that about the it. One behind the back, off the backboard. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's and so it's fast. like it's just really? unreal. So you know, like he was a guy in red, right? Red yeah. Team? Yeah. Uh, like that whole movie, and again, homage to to the street ball of Rucker Park, right? Like Jr. and I were talking about it today at, at work at just the idea of, of NBA guys wanting to go. And if you go to New York, like you got to make a visit, a pilgrimage. If you're a hoops fan to Rucker park, it's a thing. I was going to say, we might need to make a trip down there. Yeah. Rex, Rex says he's gone. So yeah, I, I heard all about Rex playing there today and had a, a hell of a jump shot. Ah! According to, according <laughs> yeah, to Rex. Talking about something, I'm like, what? I don't believe for a fact that I don't believe for a second he played there, but um, I we mean, gotta get we gotta get Rexy on the pod to yeah. to, to share his Rocker Park story. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the only other thing, and, and this will be, a, uh, you know, maybe maybe New Yorkers will pick up on this. Uh, the car that Shep is taking to airport slash bus station slash who knows train station Penn Station wherever the hell he's going to get out of town. 
in New York, you get a yellow cab or you get at best a green cab. You don't get a blue car. That's yeah. not like a limo service coming to pick them up. That's not like, that's like Billy. It looks like he's written it on the side with his magic marker. Like that's not a <laughs> legit thing. You're getting a yellow cab if you're in New York City. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so that made, that made me laugh. And I just said to my wife, that's pretty funny. The other thing, and we'll talk about this in a minute, probably in the soundtrack piece, you got to have some kind of, it, clearly it takes place in New York City. And I know we're going to talk about reasons why in a minute, but you got to have some kind of New York sound there. There's no yeah, you're like, good. It's a good point. New York music Too much whatsoever. Wow. Well, and I mean, we'll know why in here. Yeah, but, sure. But uh, yeah, that was, those are the big things to me. The basketball aside, I mean, it's entertaining. Um, and I love it for that pure reason. Like the, the focus is on the actual game. I love that. I love, you know, talking about, you know, spreading your fingers wide and snapping your wrist. Like that's just good mechanics of shooting. So I love that. Yep. Oh, that was good. I, I just had a couple of points. One, they're playing on nine foot rims. Um, mm -hmm. Motaz, illegal screens. Why do they even have refs in the tournament if they're not going to call you? <laughs> <laughs> um, Which and, also is a hilarious line when he rips birdie. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The ref. He was my one of my favorite guys, too. Um, I also had Kyle goaltended on Flip's uh, first layup when he blew when he blew by Kyle and the when they were doing the one on one. He's on the way down. You're right. It hit the backboard. It hit the backboard, and then Kyle and then swats it away. It, yeah, yeah. So that's goaltending. And then uh, the the only other thing I had was why the hell were Shep and Nutso playing in some warehouse with like <laughs> glass windows behind the net? And then how fast was Nutso going? Where he jumps basically like 10 feet past the backboard through a window <laughs> and down flat flights like i don't know i was just kind of it, they, they should have done that scene differently or had him die differently or so i don't know that was a too corny for me they were trying to do like a scorsese thing at the beginning with that scene i think and it it just yeah well, well well what would have been cool now that you know we we're talking about like that whole character arc it should have been like Nutso was killed by some kind of drug dealer. Yes, that yeah. Birdie, that, that, that Birdie, Birdie ends up like going under and taking over is some or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Like that would have made way more sense. Would have made way, they could have connected it, and that would have explained why Shep hated him. Yeah, yeah, that would make way more Good sense. Good job, Webb. That's what you should. They should. Yeah. Hey, not we just, pretty, movies, not so just a, a pretty face. Hey, Webb, let's get the Deloreys and go one point twenty one gigawatts. And there we go. <laughs> Get it up to 88 miles per hour. Back when you had a mushroom cut and you'd come stroll in with your mushroom cut. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's jump into the soundtrack. The well, music was by uh, produced by Marcus Miller. Miller was nominated for numerous Grammy Awards as a producer for Miles Davis, Luther Vandross, David Sanborn, Bob James, Shaka Khan, and Wayne Shorter, and won two Grammys. He won a Grammy for Best R&B Song in 92 for Luther Vandross's Power of Love. And in 2001, he won a Best Contemporary Jazz Album for his seventh solo instrument uh, instrumental album, M Squared. Um, what do you guys have to say about the, the album? Unlike oh, I just want to mention one more thing about the album. So Above the Rim, which I, used, I bought on cassette back in the day, and I had oh, it, oh, oh, Death oh. Row Records. It went double platinum, peaking at number one on the U.S. R&B chart and number two on the U.S. Top 40 chart for albums. You bet it did. Unlike yeah. Grumpy Webb, I'm a West Coast rap guy. So <laughs> I, I'm i death row all the way. So I don't care if there was no East Coast rap. So I love I love the West Coast rap. So I love that the West Coast rap has bells and horns and everything in it. And I love Warren G. I like the Nate Dogg in there. Tupac, Snoop. Great soundtrack. I will play with I loved it. I thought it was great. It brought back memories too. So I think it was one of the more of those things. So I, I pretty big Death Row guy. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's me. Loved it. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just I stand corrected because I just had a, a total uh, remembering of the soundtrack as I was looking at. It. There is some East Coast acts on there. Naughty by Nature. Yeah. Tretch, Tretch, notoriously good friends with Tupac, so that makes sense. Beastie Boys also make a little bit of a cameo oh, in yeah. terms of uh, one of the songs as well, yeah. DJ Hurricane. So great track there as well. Uh, I don't even know where to start with the sound. This is probably my favorite movie soundtrack of all time. This really it, like we we're we're coming on the cusp of doing a great soundtrack last week with Remember the Titans. It's a great soundtrack for a different reason, right? It's really accessible. 
if you're a hip hop head, uh, especially when you grew up in the golden era of hip hop, like we did, this is the soundtrack. Um, there's all kinds of bangers on this, 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 uh, this soundtrack. I love the fact that the way it was scored, that they scored pain, uh, pain. basically yeah. all the way through it. I love um, it. Yeah. It's, it's just such a great track. Uh, I love uh, Pump Pump when Kyle Lee Watson, you were talking about the workout montage, JR, when he's, when he's cranking out that. That's been on every single playlist, pump up tape, anything I've ever had working out. That song is always on my list. I love it. Uh, there's just some really great, I mean, and you get regulators on this song. Like, come yeah. on, or on this okay. album. Like, they, it's, it's probably one of the most uh, recognizable hip hop songs of all time. Yeah. Um, and again, R.I.P. to Nate. Dog. A lot of R.I.P.s for this movie and this soundtrack. So, Sadly, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, it's fantastic. I, I got all the time in the world for this soundtrack. I could go on and on, but I, I'm not going to. Jay, James, take over. Nope, you guys nailed it. Let's jump into our movie wrap up. Where does this rank among all time basketball movies, and where do you have it among all time sports movies? Basketball movies, probably in my top four maybe five um it could be one but i can't have it at one with there's so many cliches in here that i can't go at one and it's kind of one of those things where they, like it, the reviews do say i do agree with some of the cliche factors in here it, it, it was very predictable so for that i can't put it at one um so I, yeah i'll have somewhere in the top five overall i'll put it in the top Hmm, probably 40, 35, 40. I'll watch it. I don't know if I'll watch it again. I've watched it again. I've seen it. I probably will put it to bed. And that might be the end of me and above the room. I liked it. it I like some parts of it, but I'm going to probably just put it there and say goodbye to above the room. Okay. I've, I've got idea. it at number four on my basketball list. I've got White Man Can't Jump, Blue Chips, He Got Game, then Above the Rim. Um, and I've got it at 24 all time. I like it. It's a good movie. Um, the one thing I forgot to mention also is the MJ Aerial Assault poster. Remember, I remember that poster from back yeah. in the day. Sick With poster. The in that, there too. That was sick. Kyle Lee's Watson's that was uh, bedroom. That was, a, that, was, that was a good one. One thing I, w I did want to mention about the movie, I, I feel like a lot of uh, and this is a cultural thing too, and it shows it kind of is a nod to that. I feel like a lot of movies stole from this movie. Um, I I know I don't think you've seen this movie yet, Webb, but the way back with Ben Affleck, no, it's basically I seen it, yet. it steals probably half the movie from this. Mm. Uh, Coach Carter's got a couple things. He got game has some stuff that I think they took out of this. Um, talking about Boogaloo and Booger, you know those characters. So. Yeah, yeah I think comic relief lot. piece. Yeah, I, I enjoy this movie. Uh, a lot of the 90s culture and uh, the vibe to it really is something that brings it up for me. This is number one basketball movie, and this is probably... Ooh, it's high for me. This is like one or two. I'll go probably... I think I said... I think I'll go two. I'm going to have to go two. It's It's... I think I got Remember the Titans probably is my favorite all-time sports movie. And this is yep. a two. Um, and this is, or it could even be 1B, depending on the, so as a hoop head, I'd love this movie as a kid. I've, I've, I legitimately own the DVD. I've watched it. You know, I watch this. This is my go-to. Uh, this and Days of Thunder were my go-tos for a lot of time. Yep. Uh, I just, I, they're enjoyable to me. Uh, I love the soundtrack. I love the characters. I love the the hoop the the hooping itself. Like this is one of those movies where it doesn't matter. Even today, when I watch it, I want to like I'm sitting there on the t the couch with the basketball. This just like playing around, doing something. With it makes me want to play the sport. Yeah. Um, and now with my old white man knees, I can't do it anymore. But uh, <laughs> not well, anyways. Uh, I I love everything about this movie. I love the fact that Tupac's in it. Um, it just it's nostalgia piece alone for me is probably part of the reason why I, I have it so high and i got fond memories of it as a kid right i probably watched it on tmn a shit ton of times too like i i legitimately and i you know people exaggerate oh i've seen that movie a thousand times. 
I have legitimately probably seen this movie at least 125 times. Um, I could, I could probably do most of the movie's dialogue start to finish without actually watching the movie. Um, so yeah, it's high there for me. It's a, it's a constant go-to. Nice. So as we have been doing, obviously with a lot of our, well, all, a lot of, most of our podcast episodes now, we're going to do a draft tonight. Uh, this week's draft is going to be the most, um, uh, the, the best uh, rappers turned actors. So best rappers that turned into successful actors. Uh, I think this week it's my turn to go first. This is a tough one. I probably would have had somebody else, but some of their stuff lately pissed me off. So I'm gonna go with <laughs> I'm gonna go with my number two. I'm gonna pick uh, a guy, and I'm just gonna give you a little hint here. Mama says knock you out. So yeah. I'm gonna knock. I'm going with my boy, LL Cool J, who was Preacher in Deep Blue Sea and Julian Washington in Any Given Sunday. And he's on, uh, what's that, uh, NCIS or one of those shows? Or He's on one of those comedy NCIS Los Angeles or Los Angeles. Uh, one yeah, of those shows, yeah, yeah. I, I used to love so many LL Cool J songs back in the day. They were catchy. You know, Amazing. The funk phenomenon or whatever it was. I'm going something like a phenomenon. Nothing, something something like a phenomenon. There you go. I'm two, right, this week? Yeah. JR, you're yeah, three? You I'm three. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, this is pretty easy now that Jamer's left that door wide open. And I know I know he was I knew he wasn't gonna pick him, and so that's why I'm I'm glad it's left open. So I'm gonna take him. You gotta take Doughboy. How you not, how you you not gonna, how are you not gonna one. take He's Doughboy gonna... as your number one pick? And if for those youngins that don't the know who sell Doughboy, out. If you don't know who Doughboy is, go watch 1991. I just had to Google what year it came out. 1991's Boys in the Hood. Shout out to John Singleton. Rest in peace as well. Uh, and Ice Cube as his role as Doughboy. He's got. He's probably the most iconic character uh, in that movie. I mean, Cuba does a, our boy Cuba does a great job too. But yeah, and so is Lawrence Fishburne for that matter. But but uh, Doughboy is is the shit in this. And I mean, and then you got Cube and Friday. You know, before yeah. we before the are we there yet? So I'm going to use my previous use my previous okay. number one, and he got bumped out. Yeah, I figured you would. I mean, I I'm going to leave that aside if we're just going with the <laughs> yeah. straight acting. We're not going to bring there. this one down. We're not going to bring it down. Yeah. Okay. All right, go uh, ahead, Jr. I got pick three, so I'm going to go with a Canadian. Um, <laughs> he's a big fan. He played Jimmy Brooks on Degrassi. <laughs> I'm going to go with Drake as my third oh, overall pick. We started from the bottom, now he's here. Drizzy. I he went, go he went the opposite way. Yeah, yeah. He was an actor turned rapper. Yeah. Uh, next, my next pick is I'm going to go with. I actually want to pick this guy. I really like this guy. I like, I like his rap. I'm going to go with Andre 3000. Uh, <laughs> Brothers. I'm going to go semi pro. Show my lawn. I wanted to go Andre 3000 as a serious one. I thought he was pretty fun for that. I had to go Drake as a Amazing. He played Dabu. Dabu and uh, uh, Too Cool. Or yeah. yeah, Andre 3000 is great in roles. Great pick, Be cool. Be cool. Mm -hmm. I love that movie, Be Cool, Travolta and The Rock. Yeah. And all those guys. He was good in that. Oh, oh and Guy Ritchie's, uh, he played Avi in Guy Ritchie's uh, Revolver, which is a really good movie. Jason oh, nice. Statham. If you get a chance, know. check that out. I, was gonna say, I don't know if I've seen that one. Uh, I'm torn. I, I uh, yeah, okay, I got to do it. Uh, this guy's been in just about everything. I think he's probably more well known now as an actor than a rapper, to be quite honest. Yeah, you are. Although he's although he's hell of a lyricist as well. Uh, from the slums of Shaolin, uh, Staten Island's own. Uh, I'm going with the M E T H O D man from Garden yeah. State to yeah. He's on the wire. How can He's you not good. go with Method Man? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take him at number my with my second pick. I had him on my list. Method Man's great. That's He's great really pick. good. That's a really good pick. I'm gonna pick a guy. Uh, this guy's extremely talented. He's active and vocal in uh, in uh, human rights, uh, especially lately. And he's invaluable in our world today. Extremely good rapper. Uh, and excellent. I think he's an excellent actor. Played Elam Ferguson in Hell on Wheels. I'm going with Common. 
That's who I was gonna take. I was gonna, I thought JR was for sure gonna take him, so I was gonna cut his. I had him as my next one. <laughs> and then uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go completely off the board here. You guys are gonna <laughs> laugh. So I'm gonna need about fifty dollars to make you holla, because baby, I get paid to do the wild oh, thing. I'm taking, <laughs> I'm taking Emilio <laughs> from uh, Ace Ventura: Pet Detective. I'm taking Tone Loke. <laughs> Why? Well, I had Tone Loke on my list. <laughs> <laughs> Love tone look. Oh, uh, am I? Who's up? Is it me or you? You're back, Web. And back to me, yeah. right? Yeah, it's you. Sorry. Uh, okay. Now I'm torn because I part of me wants to go with the jammer. You got me thinking about taking a funny one just for the, for the. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna take a funny one, and this you guys will get this one from. Uh, our conversations, our, our daily mic check warm up that uh, Webb likes to take part in. Uh, I'm going to go with Canadian uh, out of the Ottawa Valley area, specifically Ottawa region, I should say. Uh, uh, part of the uh, organized rhyme collective, check the OR, if you will. Oh, Mr. God. Daddy, would you like some sausage? Daddy, no. would you like some sausage? I'm going no. with Tom Green, JR. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe we would get some shot Claire in here. No. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. Had to do it. After I had to one up your tone, Loke. Uh. All right. Well, I'm gonna fire back on my own then if you want to play this game. I'm gonna go with the man on MTV in the mid two thousands who could take a Honda Civic, and turn it into a video game car. <laughs> <laughs> this guy took it to West Coast Customs. He never touched an engine. He just made the car look cool. It was a piece of crap. Exhibit. <laughs> he could do anything. And he was so over the top. He's like, go! Oh! And they put a rim, the rims on a Chevette. It yes. didn't matter. And I put a Super Nintendo in the back. Like, the I'm going, none other than Pit My Ride Exhibit, baby. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. People Amazing. love Amazing. that show. That's a solid pick. A couple shout-outs. I mean, we left a big one off the board, which is Will Smith. Yeah. Uh, I, that's, wow. too, that's too easy, though. Too easy. Too easy. Uh, I also had uh, Queen Latifah. I had uh, Snoop Dogg. Got, Snoop Dogg was yeah. great. Some of his cameos. I was going to say, my honorable mention, Earl Simmons, a.k.a. Darkman X. Yes, yeah. I had him, too. I mean, yeah. him and Snoop Dogg, the best verses going for all you hip-hop heads. Uh, what about uh, Bow Wow and like Mike and Entourage? Oh, jeez. He's weak. He's Bow Wow. Bow Wow. We can't count know. him. You got to count Ice-T, though, man. Ice-T is one of the OGs. He was Jack Mason and Surviving the Game. You ever see that movie, Surviving the yeah. Game? The Jamer, game. I thought you were going to give a shout-out to uh, Kid and Play for uh, House Party. I did have them on my list. I yeah. did have them on my list. Uh, Ludacris. I love Ludacris. Oh, uh, the Fast and Furious. Good one. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that's about it for me. Stuff. Is Ja Rule in any shows? Uh, I, not that I can think of. No, he's he still struggling. Really. He's playing the War Memorial in Syracuse, Jay. Does the Fire Festival count? Like we were talking the about? Fire Festival. <laughs> Does that count? The Fire Festival count for anything for Ja Rule? I don't know. Oh, uh, unreal. I didn't go well. Well, tell him where to hit us up, Web. All right. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. Uh, don't forget to give us a follow on uh, on social on twitter at big league flicks and on instagram at big league flicks pod and uh don't forget to like subscribe and leave us a review awesome take Thank care you. everybody have a great one everybody cheers big league flicks jordan christian and jammer talking movies about sports and the good say and the glamour got a cold beer parent for the leading lady staring Fun facts and trivia, and man, rocket comparing soundtracks and music. They'll rate all these things. Was it real or did they lose us as the fat lady sings? Talking junk, have a giggle, comedy, drama, romance. Did the film deliver six to noon in my pants? With their big bag of tricks, these podcast critics, Jordan Christian and Jammer with Big League Flicks. Jordan Christian and Jammer with Big League Flicks. Jordan Christian and Jammer.